Hi, my name is Anoop Maney. I'm Executive Chairman of VMD Health. I'm also Group Chief Executive of Excite Ventures. So how did I get to this point and what brought me here? So thinking back, my ambition was always to leave the world in a better place than I found it. I guess aspirationally to make the world a better place. And um, why was that? I mean, I think for me, it was really about being in touch with myself and realizing that no matter what you achieve in life, at some point it gets left behind. So accumulating more wealth, accumulating assets or things for the sake of, for the sake of it was of low value to me. And therefore, whatever it, I was going to do in life, it needed to actually make a lasting improvement, something that goes beyond me. And I think that was the drive that's really shaped my life. So I started out believing I wanted to be an engineer. Um, I applied for engineering courses at university um, and I did uh, placements in engineering firms. Originally I wanted to be an aerospace um, engineer, um, potentially working in NASA. I think that was a uh, uh, something that I was thinking about in my late teens. Um, obviously that didn't happen um, for, for probably good reasons. And uh, I started out studying engineering at Cambridge. Uh, I moved on really from asking how, how airplanes and how um, thing, big lumps of metal got far into space or up into the air. I got from asking those questions from an engineering perspective to really thinking about the perspective from an organizational systems perspective. I realized that it, the engineers did the clever technology bit that got things into the air. But actually, when you really think it through, it's the organizations, it's the cooperation, it's the economics, it's the engineering and the technology, of course, but it's a holistic set of activities that together allow you to get amazing things done. And it was that that made me then flip to management. And I, I went to Warwick Business School, um, studied things from, um, I suppose, strategy to marketing to economics. Um, and my initial foray into the world of work um, was in the finance sector. I started out initially at Goldman Sachs um, for a short stint um, and then moved really into the media sector where for three or four years I was involved in a, in a very exciting role, um, something very disconnected with where I am today, where essentially I was working with um, different types of media assets. These are film, digital, um, publishing, and really doing deals where those different types of media could come together and where the whole could be worth more than the sum of its parts. So how, by bringing different types of media together, we could engage people better and actually do the job of what media was trying to do more effectively. So for three or four years, um, in a very exciting role, mainly in the US, was involved in um, um, both architecting the deals, commercializing them, um, and actually quite a lot of the creative spirit as well, which was, which was a lot of fun. So I moved on from that um, very strangely into healthcare. Uh, I never anticipated being in healthcare, but it's something that's just stuck, I guess. Um, initially from the angle of media, I joined a company which was using media to train doctors and nurses better. What I mean by that is if you're a, a medic, you're a doctor, or you're a health professional of any kind, the way that you learn is by looking at cases, um, cases of patients, or you read textbooks, um, or you look over somebody's shoulder, you know, who's actually undertaking a procedure or, or engaged in a diagnosis. What I learned very quickly was that actually the limiting factor in the quality of health is the quality of that education. If you can't see how to do a particular thing in healthcare, it's not possible for you to actually be able to do it. And so being able to use video, audio, 
3D, 2D animation, and work with some of the best medical authorities in the world, really what I found is that you could blend together and create media-based education, uh, almost edutainment, which would help best practice to be captured in a way that it could then be shared with a much greater group of doctors, and thereby actually disseminating what works quicker. And um, so for four or five years, I, I worked with, um, with this organization um, and became a real fan of healthcare. I think the thing that fascinated me most is it's one of those industries that gets the greatest levels of investment of all sectors, yet it's riddled with you know, an, an enormous number of problems at the same time. And it was those problems that attracted me, those problems that kept me in the health sector. And I, I've probably been there in that sector now for, for the last 15 years. So after four or five years of, of working in the education space, um, I'd had the privilege of working with most of the pharmaceutical organizations worldwide. I'd also had the privilege of, of working with medical royal colleges, training authorities, and leading professors in all areas of medicine, from respiratory to emergency medicine to dialysis and kidney. Um, it was a real crash course in healthcare. From there, I really got interested in how you could scale up impact in the healthcare and the healthcare sector. Now, what I mean by that is that education is one element by which you can find what good looks like and transfer it to other people. But actually, if people don't have access then to the right technologies or the right medicines, if those doctors don't have the right teams of people, or if they don't have the right, tr um, the right uh, incentives or the right space in order to be able to operate, then you can educate them and they'll just left with, be left with aspirations. So really from there on, what I wanted to do was to integrate, you know, systems of training, technologies, um, you know, of, uh, te of incentives, of strategies that could together have an enormous impact on healthcare as we know it today. So I, I ran at that point, um, left to, to run a, a, a global consulting firm that was really interested in working with organizations whose improved outcomes for patients whilst at the same time reducing costs. Um, we focused very much on capturing the essence of what it was about those um, organizations that enabled them to um, improve outcomes and reduce cost. We call that improving value in the sector. And then we aim to help scale that up and I was probably engaged in over sort of the course of four or five years, 50 or, there, 50 or so projects, again, in a, in a range of different areas of clinical medicine. Um, and it was fascinating. I mean, I learned enormous amounts. Um, we had some really interesting impacts. Um, and without knowing it, I think I became uh, a, an expert in what is now called value-based healthcare, which... Um, at the time, um, and this is now probably seven or eight years ago, was really the thing that major health systems around the world wanted to start to adopt and think about. So at that point, I was very fortunate to come across an opening in the English healthcare regulator. It was um, a, an opportunity for the NHS in the UK to actually help at a pivotal point in the strategy for the, this enormous healthcare system we have in, in, in England, um, around $180 billion a year of, uh, of taxpayers' money that consumes each year. So we wanted to find and implement systems by which we weren't just doing more each year. We didn't just want to be doing more hip operations. We didn't just want to be doing more eye checks. What we wanted to be doing was improving outcomes for every pound that was spent. And that's value-based healthcare. So I was very fortunate to lead a program called the NHS Futures Program that I think 
came in at a pivotal point of change within the NHS. And it's, I suppose, in one form or another, over the last seven to ten years, has been the implementation of that strategy within the NHS. And I don't think it's there yet, but, um, but that's another, another journey to explain. From there, um, I was then recruited into the other side of government to work with Treasury and the Department of Business really on, um, you know, saying how can we take this opportunity for improving outcomes in healthcare beyond a single health system and turn that into something which is a, a globalizable, internationalizable and commercializable opportunity. And at this point, there was a lot of talk of um, precision medicine, or many people call it personalized medicine, which would use data and use new diagnostics in a holistic fashion to improve people's health care. So I came in to, to write the business plan for a, uh, an important national UK-wide initiative um, called, at the time, the Precision Medicine Catapult. Um, and its aim was really to create an industry um, or to, to, to grow an industry in the United Kingdom that could both do good but do well at the same time. And this really brings me back to a wider interest that's, that's been with me lifelong. Um, my interest has always been about doing well by doing good. And I think that those things are intrinsically connected. In other words, if people can't do well by doing good, it's always limited. And this has been an interest for over a decade. Um, as part of my career over the last decade, I've been involved very closely with a whole slew of impact initiatives. Uh, so I'm a, still a board director of an organization called the Shaftesbury Partnership. And one of the areas we sought to tackle was to really be an incubator for initiatives that could start small, have impact at that small level, and scale to have wide scale impact. And, you know, the Shaftesbury Partnership is um, responsible for a, a range of very important activities, both in the, in the UK and outside of the UK, that have had impact at scale. And we're very proud to say that. One of those um, was the Challenge Network, uh, an organization that was created to educate 16-year-old children at a changing point in their life to connect them across social class divides and to help them to partake in projects where they could make an impact for themselves. Um, and this was something that was started up as a small pilot program and years onwards, had an intake of over 100,000 16-year-olds each year. So it's an enormous impact and um, really very proud for that. So going back to um, the, the work that I did um, at the UK level, um, what I found was that there was a, a really enormous opportunity worldwide to have an impact on healthcare as we know it today. And that really led me to what I'm doing now. So from here on, I, I founded an organization called Excite Ventures. And what Excite Ventures is all about is connecting the disorganized silos that make up the industry of healthcare. What I mean by that is to make somebody better or to have an impact on somebody's life, you have to do a whole range of things. So you might need some medicines, but you also have to intervene in the right way with the right, with the, with the right person at the right time. For that, you need diagnostics and the right diagnostics. You also then need the right treatment. So you need certain trained professionals to do certain things. You then need various other products and you need nutrition and lifestyle change very often. And these are principles that I think healthcare has, as a sector, missed. Um, they've gradually become more and more siloed uh, over the last 50 years, I would say. And I think now people are beginning to realise that these individual silos have to really come together to make healthcare ultimately both effective and sustainable. So 
my aim with Excite Ventures was really to create convergent solutions that are end-to-end -end platforms that have impact for people's health. So we set out on creating solutions for having some major impact on people with um, breathing difficulties like difficult asthma, um, major impact in people's lives who have diabetes, and also to prevent life-changing issues like heart attacks, and doing that in an integrated and holistic fashion. And so over the past three to four years, I've been working closely with a number of very large global insurance companies, technology companies, world-leading clinicians, and through Excite Ventures, our aim is to turn those into solutions that can have worldwide impact. But this was at the point that COVID struck in February of 2020. I also was chairman of a company called VMD, Visionary Medical Diagnostics, of which I then became executive chairman. VMD had previously a different strategy. We were testing eyes in care homes. But what happened is we realized that as diagnostics experts, we knew that COVID wasn't really going to be controlled by laboratory-based tests. If you have to take a swab, which goes to the back of your neck um, and throat, and then you have to ship that to a laboratory with a delay. The laboratory has to process it. You have to get a result back. By that point, you will have infected other people. And also there are a range of issues that cause those sorts of tests to suffer from challenges of when those swabs are in transit. Um, they cause deterioration in the virus. And that means that really what you have to do to get um, COVID under control is to um, rapidly test for the virus at the point, but using the same grade of test that is often used in the laboratories. Still, technology that looks for the virus. The, uh, what I mean by that is the virus RNA directly. So as VMD, what we understood was testing in environments outside of laboratories. And so we really sought to create alliances with organizations um, worldwide that had the right sorts of technologies that could very quickly identify in minutes um, the COVID virus RNA and quickly and immediately digitally give that result. In a test platform, that the test device itself needed to, needs to be robust. And that's critical because if you're going to put the hands uh, you know, these sorts of technologies in people's hands at the front end, you know, either in, in, a, in a public environment uh, or in an airport or in a, in a care home setting, these things have to be robust because they're not going to be in a laboratory in a clean environment. They're going to be in dirty environments where they're dropped. Um, I use the uh, phrase, they have to pass the dog hair test. In other words, if somebody's dog chews on it, it has to still work. And so we really went on a search worldwide for companies with that sort of technology. And I think we found the best of them. And actually, we didn't find many. We found one, maybe two. And so what we've done now under VMD is we've partnered with um, the most exciting direct COVID identification technologies that directly find the virus RNA. And what we've sought to do is to go into the second part of what's needed, is that you then have to be able to implement the, a whole series of responses based on whether somebody's infected or not infected at the point that you find the person. In other words, you can't, treat a, you can't treat a point of control test or a point of care test in the same way that you treat a laboratory test. 
Um, you can't wait for somebody to phone you 48 hours later to tell you what action to take. That capability, that training, the response has to be built into whichever environment is actually trying to control the viral movement. And that's exactly what we're doing now. We're working with international global regulatory authorities to create standards by which we can use these sorts of technologies in a way to actually control the movement of the virus rapidly. Um, and I think it's going to be a game changer. We've already, we saw the first wave, the toll that that had on people's lives, the economic toll that that had. People are still, we're all still at home, working from home. Some of these things are, are positive. Some of these things really can't continue if we were to see elements of the economy recover, or if we're to protect people's health from actually contracting the virus in the first place. We really have to get ahead and control the virus. And that's what we're doing as VMD Health. And so I suppose that's the effect that COVID has had on me personally, is that rather than getting me down, getting me upset, you know, causing me to look in other directions. What I've done and what our teams have done, what our organizations have done, is really sought to address the challenge, to solve the problem, and to solve it in a way that we can address internationally. And that's very much the impact of COVID on, on me. Um, outside of work, um, and yes, I have a personal life, uh, two kids, and a wife. I mean, I think it's been fascinating to see the resilience of, of my children who are in their early teens um, and their ability to educate from home. So I think on a very personal note, it's also made me realize that we can as individuals, as humans adapt. What we need is hope. What we need is the right tools. And if we have those two things, then very often a problem can itself turn into an opportunity. So what about the future? For me and for the rest of the world, what is it gonna mean? So I think for me, it means I'm extremely busy. It means that we really have to operate in the fastest possible way. We have to collaborate with government organizations, with manufacturing organizations, with delivery organizations to really make some of the things that I've been working on happen at scale and speed. And I think that is absolutely critical. Um, I don't want to miss out investment organizations because I think they have an enormous role to play in a crisis such as this, um, both in underpinning confidence in the markets as they stand today, but also in identifying solutions that can help control risk and manage risk. So that's um, a bit about the effect on me. I think maybe more broadly, some of the health initiatives that I've been working on in, in asthma, in cardiovascular, in diabetes, all of these are going to have to be more virtual than things were previously. You know, we've been used to a, a life whereby, you know, you go to see a doctor, you go to see a nurse. Is that the thing that's going to happen in the future? I think we've already experienced uh, an alternative to that. And I think it's good in some ways and it's bad in other ways. But what we need to do is to innovate around those challenges to turn them into better experiences than we ever had with the healthcare system. And I think overall that can only be a good thing. Of course, personal contact is absolutely necessary. We are you know, animals of affection. Proximity makes us feel confident. 
And therefore, we do need to bring people together again. But I think in order to do that in a way that's lower risk, especially for people with comorbidities and with health risks, we need to do that in a way that uses um, testing to, to, to ensure that those interactions are safe. Um, so I, that's the reflection for me and what I have to do. I think more broadly, you know, are things ever going to be the same? I don't think they are. I think whatever happens, even if COVID disappears in two years, which it's unlikely to, you know, quite um, frankly, you know, uh, the scientific exp expectation is that this is something that's here to stay. It's never really going to go. Uh, much like the seasonal flu has been around and will be around, so will COVID. So we don't expect it to go away. But if it did go away, for example, would everything go back to normal? No, I don't think it would. Because risk, our understanding of risk has changed fundamentally. Our appreciation of the risk of viruses has fundamentally shifted. We all thought about this idea of Ebola before. And, you know, there was um, a, a number of movies, I'm sure, based on the idea of Ebola spreading or something like Ebola spreading. And those were really, really frightening. But did we think that they could happen beyond Hollywood? No, we didn't really, um, because that was confined to such a small group of people in such a small, confined area. I think now we get it. You know, if SARS-CoV-2 had had one-tenth of the effect on people that Ebola did, it would be you know, 10 times a bigger disaster as it has been already. So those risks have become absolutely real. You know, covering for those risks through insurance is going to be important, I think, in due course. But more importantly, those risks have to be insurable. So there really have to be in solutions in place to mitigate those risks um, for society. And I, and I think that's, um, that's fundamentally what's, what's going to shift. Beyond that, there are a whole series of industries that are going to have a different way, uh, a different set of expectations they're going to have to adopt. So, for example, the air industry. Yes, with testing, we can absolutely return volumes to higher um, places than they are now. But... Will they ever return to where they were before? I don't know. And, you know, people have become used to um, meeting less, of uh, doing more things virtually. And that simply means that there is likely to be a major impact on industries that require people to move and meet, move and meet. So I think those sectors should not be under a false belief that they'll spring back to 100%. They might spring back to 80. And I think that would be a fantastic result. But I think that would be my, my point for the future. I think the other thing which is a great caution, and I think society needs to do something about, is we really need to help young people. Young people who are transitioning from you know, A-levels or, you know, high school to college and university, they've had a really rocky ride. What are the entry requirements? What are the things, are they, are they actually going to get the result that they wanted? Now they've got into institutions and they're unsure as to whether they'll be able to, be able to stay there. They can't socialise with their peer groups. Things that everybody's taken for granted previously are not possible. And I think that those people need a whole raft of solutions to help them to cope, but also to help them to become more resilient and more adaptable. And I think that's my final take-home message. What is it that society needs to do here on? I think we need to realise that adaptability is critical. It's not only important from a health perspective individually, but it's critical for economies. Building in the ability to innovate, adapt, adjust is very much what Charles Darwin 
talked about in his um, natural laws. It's not the fittest, it's not the largest animals that survive. It's those that are most capable and able to adapt. And I think that's probably my closing message. Thank you.